Welcome to the Teacher's Toolkit for Literacy, the free podcast for motivated teachers and school leaders who want to inspire their students and school community in literacy learning. Make sure you subscribe to the show on your favourite podcast player, and for more amazing literacy resources, check out the show notes provided with every episode. Hi, I'm Sharon, and I'm the host of a Teacher's Toolkit for Literacy. In every toolkit episode, we bring you specific resources, tools, strategies, tips, techniques to help you in your job as a teacher of literacy. Firstly, we acknowledge and pay our respects to the Ghana people, the traditional custodians whose ancestral lands we gather on. We acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and relationship of the Ghana people to country, and we respect and value their past, present and ongoing connection to the land and cultural beliefs. And welcome, Phil. And welcome back to part three of our podcast on Blessing the Book. And over to Sharon. All right, on I go. So, The Letterbox Tree by Rebecca Lim and Kate Gordon, who we've just had Indigo and the Storm by Kate Gordon. My tree. So, I'm reading the blurb. The one thing in this world that doesn't judge me and sees me how I really am. With sea levels rising and the land deforested, overmined and affected by bushfires and drought, Tasmania is increasingly marooned, its people abandoned. Nix's father wants them to leave while they still can, but for Nix, West Hobart is all she's ever known and where her mother is buried. She seeks solace in the single surviving tree near her home, an 80-foot pine tree that has defied all odds. And the book begins, Nix. You've got to understand, Nixie, Dad said, his voice the usual strange mix of urgent and hopeless. When the floods come, and they're going to come, someday soon, home will be gone. Right, next one is by Jeremy Lachlan. It's called Jane Doe and the Quill of the Tales. The blurb, Jane Doe is no ordinary girl. A child of three ancient gods, she can control the manor, a sacred realm between worlds. Lately, though, it seems the manor's been controlling her and she's terrified of what that could mean. And when Jane discovers she's the rightful heir to a powerful, long-lost relic, she must cast her fears aside and journeys through the manor to find it. The relic... The Phantom Quill is said to grant visions of every future in every world. In the right hands, a tool for good. In the wrong hands, a weapon of chaos. And a dangerous cult is already hot on its trail. First page, this is not the beginning. Chapter 1, The Orphans. The boy had been hiding for months, sticking to the shadows, sleeping in trees, only creeping into the village after dark, to steal scraps from the smouldering campfire. Tonight, he finds a roasted taro in the ashes and the remains of a picked-at kappa bird, filthy but edible. He gnaws at the carcass until his belly is almost full, finds a jug of water too, and kicks it over. When we bless a book in this way, our reading of it should be what's bringing this book to life and brings the blessing of it. So it is our job as reader and blesser of the book to do what the author would like us to do with that book. And let's refer people to that lovely Memfox podcast on reading aloud. We've got a link to that one too. Yes, yeah. Um, The next one is Dusty in the Outwilds by Rhiannon Williams. I'm doing the blurb, step into an unforgettable new land. Dusty has grown up hearing whispers about her mysterious Aunt Meg, who went off to live out wild and never returned. Yet Dusty's father refuses to discuss what happened, and her only clue is a photograph of her aunt as a young girl with a strange monkey-like creature on her shoulder. (laughs) I love the dedication in this book. For the boy and the spaghetti. Chapter 1. A murderous uncle. Probably. There was a door in Gran's house that no one ever opened. Dusty had come to think of it as part of the wall, 
but today something was different. An old iron key was sitting in the lock. Next book, Meet Me at the Moon by Siobhan Plozer. Blurb. Dad said everything is magic and science is just figuring out how magic works. For Karina Sudgen, nothing is more special than a moon tree, a tree grown from the seeds taken on the Apollo 14 mission into space. Her father taught her everything she knows about them, but he passed away before they found one together. When mum relocates the family to the Otway Ranges, side note, Evie and the Rhino, Otway Ranges, so we're in that place in Australia again, Karina becomes determined to find a moon tree on her own. Like a scientist, she carefully searches the forest behind her new house, but after a mysterious encounter with a black cockatoo, Karina realises there's magic in this forest, and if magic exists, anything is possible, like seeing her dad one last time. Chapter 1, A Little Magic not many people know about moon trees. And that's how the story begins. I'm not going to read in. That's the first paragraph of the story. Mm. The Impossible Secret of Lillian Velvet. So this is one in a series. So a Kingdoms and Empires book. And it's by Jacqueline Moriarty. Lillian Velvet lives a very lonely life with her cold and removed grandmother. That is, until her 10th birthday when she's given a pickle jar of gold coins, along with a note with clear instructions. Don't go out, don't open the door for anyone, and don't spend all the coins in one day. What happens next seems impossible. The coins whisk Lillian away to a different time and place. There she meets a small boy in a circus about to be crushed to death. A lively family, each member in a distinctive form of mortal danger, a boy with a skateboard, and a girl who can whisper, and a web of dangerous magic closing tight around them all. Why is Lillian here? How is she supposed to help these new friends? And most importantly, what happens if she fails? Begins with a map, because we are in lands. Part one. Report number one. 20 years ago, Gainsley Harbour, kingdoms and empires and the chapter begins this was the time of the whispering wars so like that last book it Mm. just begins with one sentence Uh, the next book the bookseller's apprentice amelia melor this book this one follows on from oh her first one was the grandest bookshop in the world so many of you will know that one Blurb on this one, 12-year-old Billy Pike has a talent for sorting things out. Whether it's his chaotic family home or the busy book stall at Paddy's Market. In 1871, the market is the loud, smelly, marvellous heart of Melbourne and Billy is delighted to work at the book stall there for the eccentric Mr Cole. When his new friend Kezia warns him of a sinister magician called the Obscuro Smith... Billy can't believe her stories of magical deals gone horribly wrong until he sees them happening. And the night that the obscure Smith crosses a terrifying and dangerous line, Billy realises something. If he wants the obscure Smith stopped, he'll have to do it himself. And so it begins. Chapter 1. The Market Carnival. Paddy's market was loud, filthy and wild. That's how it begins. One line. Great start. Yeah. Um, now, Katrina Nanestead, many of you will know her from Tinker Tailor, Soldier Spy and We Are Wolves. This is her book, Silver Linings. And our blurb is, Nettie Sweeney has a dad, three big sisters, a farm full of cows and a cat called Mittens, but it's not enough. She longs for a mother one with a gentle touch and sparkles in her eyes. Instead, she has Auntie Edith with slappy hands, a sharp tongue and the disturbing disbelief that peas are proper food. When Dad marries Alice, all Nettie's dreams come true. The Sweeney home overflows with laughter, love and in time a baby brother, Billy, the light of Nettie's life. 
then tragedy strikes. The Sweeney family crumbles. Nettie tries to make things right, but has she made everything so much worse? And I'm just looking at Phil's face. Already I see yeah. Phil understands empathy will be required yeah. to read this book. Um, it begins with a map of the Sweeney farm and their farmhouse. Chapter 1. This is no surprise for Katrina Nanestead that she begins this way. Like the three books before this one, it begins with one line. The piglet is dead. Mm, powerful. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I do have her other um, recent book, Waiting for the Storks, Katrina Nanestead. I don't want to remember the truck or the night I was taken or the family I left behind. I'm not a sad Polish girl. I'm a good and happy German girl. I am. I am. I am. It's the Second World War and Himmler's Lebensborn program is in full flight when eight-year-old Sofia Alinsky is kidnapped by the Germans. She has blonde hair and blue eyes just like the other Polish children taken from their families and robbed of their names, their language and their heritage. But when Zofia is adopted into a wealthy and loving German family, it's easier, it's safer to bury her past, deep down, so that everything is forgotten until the Polish boy arrives and the past comes back to haunt her. Chapter 1, Waiting for the Storks. It actually begins... Not with a um, chapter, this is prefacing the chapter one, and it's a Heinrich Himmler quote. Mm. I really do have the intention to gather Germanic blood from the whole world, to rob it, to steal it, wherever I can. Yeah. Yeah. So these are the big theme and mature theme books yeah. that are good for... Conversation as read alouds and for some of our children, the one to bless for them as their own. Incredible discussions coming from these two. Yeah, yeah. Um, We do have an illustration on the page here, prefacing chapter one. Um, A father, a girl on his lap, a mother, I'm assuming father, mother, girl on lap. Um sitting across the table from each other and everybody laughing. And we've got the line here, cream on your salami or gravy on your poppy seed cake. Make a choice. And chapter one begins in Krakow, Poland, December 1941. And there is our line, cream on your salami or gravy on your poppy seed cake. All right, next one is My Brother Ben by Pete Carnavis um, with Morris Gleitzman blessing this book with his review on the front for everyone whose brother is a hero, even if they don't know it yet. I will also make mention, because the copy I'm sitting with of this book has also got three stickers on the front. So, one... Children's Book Council of the Year Awards Notable Book, Queensland Literary Awards Finalist and winner of the New South Wales Premier's Literary Awards for 2022. So right there we have three other blessings. So awards can also guide us to when we pick up a book to go, aha, Here is, you know, for us to notice it has been blessed too. Blurb, Luke and his big brother Ben spend the summer on the banks of Cabbage Tree Creek. Quiet Luke sketches birds while Ben leaps off the jumping tree. The boys could not be more different, but they share the same dream. Winning a boat so they can explore the creek properly. Then Ben starts high school and the boys drift apart. When Luke catches Ben sneaking out at night... He knows his brother's up to something, but what? A timeless story of birds and boats and of brotherly love that is bigger than a wedge-tailed eagle, bigger than the sky. Prologue. Lovely. Prologue, a strange feathered thing. 
Last year, I found a dead bird on the road outside our house, a young magpie, grey and white. It lay flat with its head on the side, one wing stretched out and the other squashed under its own body. I crouched down, hugged my knees to my chest and stared. Wind tickled the tiny feathers on the bird's breast. Its legs stuck out like black twigs and the back of its neck glowed pink in the setting sun. So we have our little prologue here by the author before the story begins. And next book that I've chosen to bless is called What Snail Knows by Catherine Appel. First of all, the blurb. Lucy and Dad move a lot, so it's hard to make friends. Lucy's glad she has Snail, the perfect pet for a lonely girl. If only she had her own shell to hide in every time she started a new school. But this place is different. She likes her teacher, Miss Darling. She likes her classmates, especially Tani. She even likes Mayhew's Van Park, where she lives with Dad and Snail. This place feels like home. Can she convince her dad to stay? So this book, whilst a fiction story, we have immediately come to the contents page and find the contents listed. I'm always fascinated by how books are um, constructed and designed. And so contents here, every uh, chapter title is in lowercase. So there are no capitals to indicate title. And so we're immediately geared into thinking, okay, something's a little different with the layout here. So contents, page one, our family. Page 13, this place. Page 33, just one question. When we move into the book, we get this wonderful page that prefaces the first of the contents, our family. We have a snail beneath. And then we have a collection of... I'm going to say verses, but it's narrative verse that we then have beneath that topic of our family. So we have just you and me. Then we have what if. Next one is and snail. So within that content section, I can't really call it a chapter, but under that heading, we then have a lot of verses that tell or free verse That tells the story. Um, A few other really interesting features of the text is that for the verse or the section where it talks about, I'll just read this part, you won't be able to see it, but first of all, just listen to the words. Dad said the same thing he'd said every time we'd moved before. It's just you and me, Lucy. We don't need nobody else. Now, what you can't see but is an incredible extra layer for the reader is that those three sentences are all written in a shape. The words are arranged to form the numeral two. And so there's this point, you know, about Dad saying we don't need nobody else, just the two of us. But here we have this beautiful layout of text in the shape of the numeral two. so Very clever, Sharon. So clever. So it makes us slow down as readers. It makes us think not just about blah, 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 reading, but it is in the way the words are arranged on the page as well that really bring us to deeper meaning, to deeper understanding and really honouring the author in thinking about what are they really trying to say. What Snail Knows begins with this heading, just you and me. It's just you and me, Lucy, Dad said, when all the other prep kids were making Mother's Day cards, and I asked, where's my mummy? It's just you and me, Lucy, Dad said, when the year one teacher at a different school wanted us to draw our family tree, and I asked, why don't I have a grandma and a granddad? So, what snail knows? Lovely for its layout and for its story. Right, next one is How to Spell Catastrophe by Fiona Wood. And for the blurb, 
Can catastrophe expert Nell McPherson foil her mum's awful plan to blend their family, keep her balance on the wobbly friendship tightrope and successfully campaign for Grade 6 to strike for climate action? Oh, and sort of as the, the byline, what's the worst thing that could happen? That's good. So this one's such a fun, um, I'm going to say, rollick of, you know, those things that are dealt with in everybody's lives, you know, parents, children, and the way things are navigated. It's not a verse novel, but has some, as most books generally do, and I find that it's one thing that students don't always um, have an awareness of, looking at the way text is laid out. So I'm going to read the first of the um, the first chapter here called Like Being on a Swing. And I will read it in a way that I hope indicates to you that it isn't just straight text in an ordinary fashion on the page. In another world, I love mornings and I even like school most of the time. Nell... Eleanor, in the world of right here, right now, this particular Friday, 13th of August, 7.08am, even though I know there's going to be a spelling bee meeting with snacks today, I just don't feel like getting out of bed. And so the story begins. But you'll notice that I've read that in a very intentional way, because that last sentence that was really read word by word wasn't punctuated by punctuation, but I read it that way because each word in that sentence was listed beneath each other. So once again, gets us to read in a particular way, and I think that's the real thrill of what publishers and authors are doing in texts is not just using punctuation, but using layout, arranging print on the page to help us read and interpret and infer in particular ways. Makes it much more engaging, doesn't it? Yeah, and just brings huge amounts of meaning and I think wondering to, aha, so what's going on here? Let me read that. Hmm. Do I think that the way I read it you know, enabled the the author to give their message or shall I just try that again? And I think it's that joy in trying things again that is such a great skill for our children or our students, you know, to be thinking, okay, what were they really trying to say here and how else might I read that? There's also an anticipation of what might be coming next. You know, what else is the author and the publisher going to do? Oh, so true, so true. And I think the word engaging you used is exactly the right one in terms of Mm. really activating all of our thinking as a wanderer, as a reader, as an understander. Right, the next one is called, next book is called Sunshine on Vinegar Street by Karen Comer. This one, the blurb says, Freya's world is turned upside down when she and her mum moved to inner city Melbourne. Stuck in a new apartment on the 11th floor, and Freya is afraid of lifts. Stuck in a basketball team where not everyone likes a new star player. Stuck in a classroom of kids who don't know Freya is a donor-conceived baby. Stuck, just like little Audrey in the Skipping Girl sign, suspended over the suburb of Abbotsford. Being the new girl makes Freya feel like a dark cloud on a summer's day. Can she figure out how to belong on Vinegar Street? And isn't that the immortal dilemma for change and finding our place to belong? So this chapter, so this book, I will be speaking about layout again because this one is actually a whole series of verses again. Free verse, written then collectively and organised as a story. And so this one actually begins on the first page with the traditional skipping rhyme, Salt, vinegar, mustard, pepper, if I dare, I can do better. And so the story begins with the first of the verses, Power of Three. The goodbye card from my friends is worn from extreme handling 
extreme reading. Dear Freya, you are amazingly talented, the best centre player ever. Your basketball rebounds should be studied. Your never miss from the right gooseneck shot should be cloned. We're going to miss you so much. Wish we could be together for grade six and forever. Our power of three is never going to be the same ever, ever, ever again. Thanks, Sharon. Well, we've come to the end of part three of our podcast. So many great books. What do you think, Sharon? Oh, and I'm still sitting here with a bundle of two, four, six, eight, ten, a dozen books sitting in front of me that haven't made it onto the podcast, which I says, <laughs> which I think says something extraordinary. We are rich for great literature here in Australia and from authors who really, through their craft, bring us real insight through story about our world, about others, and to help us learn about ourselves. And we can bring our teaching alive through using these great books in amazing ways that are examples of great ways to read and great ways to write. Yeah. And even if we don't do amazing things with the book, Mm -hmm. the most amazing thing is to bring books to children and I think by simply bringing them and sharing something as simple as the blurb and the the opening lines of the book are that blessing. They are such powerful ways to open doors for children to find their own stories and to find Stories that, as we mentioned earlier, might be mirrors of our own Mm, life that that. help us Mm. understand ourselves some more and particularly situations that we might be in, that they can also be such powerful windows for us to look into other worlds, to look into Mm. other people's lives and to learn how we can respond and learn to understand and build empathy for situations that aren't our own. And also, I think, well, I was just thinking, Sharon, that we could actually just run our whole podcasts on reading books out. <laughs> we, we could. I've got another 12 sitting right in yeah, front of me that, we, can, that mean, we could do. Every, and Every week we could be doing it. But I think uh, just great to have done it in this series of podcasts. And I think, um, anything else to... Yeah, I also did just want to say that there is just great strength and great, I'm going to use the word passion, whenever teachers talk to me about the impact that the read aloud they have chosen to read to their students, when they talk about what that impact is Mm. on having Mm. read that book to students the conversations that have come from that, the understandings, the awareness or the awareness raising, the wonderings, the insights, the questioning. And all shared because we're all doing it and listening to it together. Yes, yeah. And I suppose because I've, you know, come out of a planning stage with a lot of teachers, just about every teacher has prefaced the success of their previous units that they are also just, you know, wanting to reflect on. Nearly all of them have prefaced them with, this book, this book was so powerful that we used as our read aloud. Mostly, if I'm talking about upper primary teachers, it's usually the chapter book. So, you know, that it's, that text has been such a mentor to students in all those ways I mentioned earlier, but it's that joy and that absolute heartfelt, you know, hand-on-heart kind of this book was so great to experience together as a class and transformed us as people and transformed us as learners. And my new word is I think it's like a spice we're adding to our teaching. Yeah. 
Okay, Sharon, we're definitely at the end of part three of our podcast (laughs) and we look forward to everyone joining us for part four. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the podcast. To make sure you don't miss any literacy learning tips and insights, please subscribe to our show on your favourite podcast player. At Q Learning, our literacy specialists draw on over 30 years of teaching and international consulting experience to deliver world-class learning solutions. We equip, empower and support teachers to become their authentic selves. To find out about upcoming webinars and about how Q can help you and your school, visit qlearning.com.au. And you can get even more amazing teaching resources right now at teachific.com.au. Stay tuned.